God of miracles, sometimes we are slow to believe in your power, even when your miracles occur all around us each and every day. Open our eyes to see and our hearts to believe. Amen. The first reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We, re we refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds, of the, blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let your light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to John, the fifth chapter. Jesus said to them, the rulers of the Jewish religion, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. The Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and he will show him greater works than these so that you will be astonished. Indeed, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whomsoever he wishes. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, Anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, the hour is coming, and it is now here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be astonished at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. A little history first. If we do not learn history, we have to do it again ourselves. When the Romans came into power over the Jewish region of, our, of where Christianity began, began they granted a king limited authority under a Roman governor. The Jews were hostile to the new regime and following years witnessed frequent insurrections. 
a last attempt to restore the former glory, defeat, and death ruled to the end of 40 B.C. And the land became a providence of the Roman Empire. In 37 B.C., Herod was appointed king of Judea by the Romans, granted almost unlimited autonomy in the country's internal affairs. He became one of the most powerful monarchs in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. A great admirer of Greco-Roman culture, Herod launched a massive construction program. He remodeled the temple into one of the most magnificent buildings of its time. But despite his many achievements, Herod failed to win the trust and the support of his Jewish subjects. Ten years after Herod's death, 4 B.C., Judea came under direct Roman administration, growing anger against increased Roman supposition of Jewish life resulted in sporadic violence, which escalated into a full-scale revolt in 66 AD. Superior Roman forces were finally victorious, raising Jerusalem at the, at the ground in 70 AD and defeating the last Jewish outpost in 73 AD. The total destruction of Jerusalem and the temple was catastrophic for the Jewish people. Hundreds of thousands of Jews perished in the siege. And elsewhere in the country, and many thousands more were sold into slavery. A last brief period of Jewish sovereignty in ancient times followed after a revolt in 132 AD, during which Jerusalem and Judea were regained. However, given the overwhelming power of the Romans, the outcome was inevitable. Three years later, it comfortably, it conformed with custom, Roman custom, with Roman custom. Jerusalem was plowed up with a yoke of oxen. Judea was Palestine, was Palestine and Jerusalem, Alia Capitolia. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Although the temple has been destroyed and Jerusalem burned to the ground, the Jews and Judaism survived. Their faith served as the common bond among them and was passed on from generation to generation. In the midst of the Jewish conquest, Christianity was born. I'm reminded of Jesus' words that we will hear later in the Gospel of John. My kingdom is not of this world. How many empires have come and gone throughout history? In the top 10, the largest one is 1,480 years of length. Christianity is now 2,000 years old. The Gospel of John was written around 100 AD, given or take 20 years. That community experienced these tragedies, and they endured. This Sunday is Transfiguration Sunday. The other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were arguably written before the Gospel of John, and they tell the story of Jesus going up a mountain with Peter, James, and John. There, Jesus meets Moses and Elijah, the Old Testament leader who gave the commandments and the Old Testament leader who was the great prophet who rose into heaven. Thus, in this meeting, it is understood that Jesus was aligned with all of the laws and all of the prophets. He, at that moment, was to fulfill what was to come. It had aligned everything needed. And at that moment, a bright cloud covered all of them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. From this point forward, Jesus turns toward Jerusalem, not to overthrow the occupying government and put himself into power. No, Jesus came for so much more. He took the sin of the whole world upon himself, was crucified died, and was buried. Over the next 40 days of Lent, we will remember this walk. We need to be reminded that those 
with Jesus were terrified, not knowing what would happen. But we know the rest of the story. Yet, like them, we still cling to the temporary. Let me repeat Paul's words to the Corinthians. I invited Pam to go on a few verses to speak to our point today. Since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness. Who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that we may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be, vi be visible in our bodies. From the beginning we are told we are created in the image of God. May we find our direction, our strength, our hope in that truth while simultaneously being one, being only an image, we, all, we are also reminded of our frailty. Treasure in earthen vessels is a powerful double metaphor that recognizes the awesome trust God bestows upon each one of us and this, at the same time honors the fragility as bearers of God's grace and might. The image allows Paul to celebrate the awesome blessing of life and joy in tribulation, limitation, and difficulty. Because we are God's chosen vessels, we do not need to build cathedrals or make pilgrimages, pilgrimages to engage in the extraordinary actions to prove our faith. Instead, we simply need to live our lives each day in ways that love and honor all people. That is exactly what Jesus attempted to do in our gospel reading today. He is responding to the religious leaders' outrage. Their concern is twofold. Jesus was breaking the Sabbath and making himself equal to God. Jesus' explanation is that the Son is incapable of doing anything apart from the Father. This apprentice relationship of Father and Son was common in the Near Eastern culture during Jesus' time. And the two things given to the Son included giving life and making judgment. Both were God's doing in the Old Testament. This is the life given and judgment made. If a person knows Jesus, recognizing him as God, that person receives a new identity. God can change a person's heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our primary identity is to Jesus. May we be the ones transfigured this Sunday. Transfiguration refers to a change in form of appearance, and the root transfigure simply means to transform into something more beautiful or elevated. So transfiguration is a specific form of transformation. God is with us already. If we feel that we cannot draw closer to God experiencing this transfiguration, the barrier is in ourselves and not God. So what do you feel separates you from God? How can you transform that barrier into a bridge? Do this and you will be transformed, transfigured. Is what has occurred throughout history, not just between people, but countries and cultures. It is what I cling to today. When the USSR dissolved in December 1991, the waves of persecution against Christians came to a halt. The introduction of freedom of expression and belief made it possible to preach Christianity in the strongly atheist post-USSR society. In some traditional churches, the style of services had changed. Many new churches were formed. The number of Protestant denominations increased rapidly. God has not and will not be defeated. I invite you to make the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services a part of your Lenten journey this year. 
as we walk alongside the people of Ukraine. They've posted this prayer on their page, which is lirs.org forward slash Ukraine dash crisis. Let us pray. God of love and peace, we pray for your people, men, women, and children, whose lives are in peril in the Ukraine. We pray for the vision to see and the faith to believe in a world emancipated from violence. Heal the wounds of body, mind, and spirit that will occur due to the violence in our world. Help us to devote ourselves to the task of making peace in our own neighborhoods and our own world. No one is hidden from your love. Help us be home to others. Help us manifest your love and your peace in your world. Amen.